I've got a quick presentation which talks about why plastic's an issue and tries to put that in the context of the wider issues of materials and climate change in general. And it also talks about some of the things you can do from awareness raising through to policy work through to really quite hard edged campaigning on incinerators, for instance. So I'll touch on all of those things and then we'll see when we get to discussion time who wants to talk about what. But if that's OK, I'll just proceed with a presentation just on the basics of plastic. So starting off with some figures about plastic in Europe. So 90 percent of plastic is made from fossil fuels. There is some other stuff made from often biological materials, but 90% of it comes from fossil fuels and both oil and gas are used to make plastics. And so the issue of plastics is also very clearly uh, an issue about climate change because while we continue to make plastics from oil and gas, we're supporting the oil and gas industry and we're prolonging the climate change problem that that industry produces. And plastics if they end up being burnt then of course they put that fossil carbon straight back into the atmosphere and so they're very directly contributing to climate change and as Barry's already mentioned there's a very strong fracking link so there's fracking happening in various places principally the states which is supplying the industry that makes plastic and that happens at Ineos at Grangemouth so there's fracked gas coming to Grangemouth and being turned into plastic or plastic precursors and about 40% of plastic goes into packaging. So that's the bit that most people are thinking about when they think about plastic. Uh, they're thinking about just yesterday, we saw uh, an explorer in the very deepest part of the ocean finding a sweetie wrapper in uh, five miles down in the Marianas Trench. So even the most remote bits of the planet are contaminated by plastic and often that's from packaging. Only about 30% of plastics in Europe are recycled. So that's a huge waste of material. 70% of it, something else is happening. And I'll come on to where it ends up in a second. Uh, so let me move on. Uh, this is where your plastic ends up. So you buy a piece of plastic in some form, a chair, a bottle, whatever it is. Some of it goes for recycling. I've already said that's about 30% of it. Some of it goes to be incinerated. So that makes some energy but it also releases the fossil carbon that's in the plastic. Uh, and so that's certainly not the best option. And in terms of reusing that material, of course, properly reusing it or recycling it is much better than burning it. Some of it goes and ends up in landfill. And of course it may escape from landfill or it may sit there for thousands of years while it very slowly degrades. And as we've seen lots of publicity about in the last three or four years, lots of it ends up in the oceans and it pollutes our shores, it's a problem for wildlife, um, and it's very unsightly. And just very briefly about the size of plastic, this is a set of graphs about um, what turns up in rivers and off the coast of the UK, and which comes from land. And so you can see the big orange bar is large plastic items. So that's bread crates, it's old chairs, it's um, fishing floats, and there's lots of that, 18,000 tonnes, um, and that's, that's very obvious because they're big things, but actually almost as big, 13,000 tonnes, is microplastics, from, in that case from tyres, so as tyres are used, driven around, they produce lots of dust. That adds to air pollution, but it also washes down into the sewer system and it ends up in rivers and then at the coast. So actually tire dust is really important. Plastic in paints is important. Washing clothes, that's been had some recent publicity. That's also a big issue when you wash your clothes. If they're synthetic plastic fibers, then they're going again into the water courses. And plastic pe pellets, the nurdles, the precursors of plastic objects, which are uh, wasted in incredible quantities from in transport and at factories, they end up polluting our coasts as well. So what can you do about plastic? If you're a policymaker or you're a supermarket or you're a retailer or you're a producer, what is it you can do to reduce your use of plastics? Uh, well, a good thing is banning them, obviously, and in some limited circumstances that's happened. So in at the UK level and in Scotland, We've banned micro beads. So these are very tiny um, beads of plastic, which were in cosmetics and sun cream and things like that. And most of those are now banned in the UK. So that's the first big action the UK government took and Scotland's done that too. 
uh, in France, something very noticeable, um, plastic plates and plastic cutlery for takeaways have been banned uh, or in the process of being banned. So you can still get yourself a takeaway bamboo knife, for instance, but you can't get plastic single use, one trip before it's thrown away, plastic. So that's good. Uh, alongside bands and often complementary to it is substituting something else, some other material that isn't plastic. And in Scotland, we have two examples that are in the process of happening. So Scotland is going to ban plastic straws and pl plastic stemmed cotton buds. Uh, but we can do that because there are easy substitutes available. So cardboard straws and cotton buds with cardboard sticks are already easily available. They're as good or very nearly as good or in some cases better and so that's quite an easy thing to do but substituting is a very important technique. We can try to reduce the quantity of some major item and the big success story there in the last few years is plastic bags that we use in supermarkets so the industry, supermarket industry was challenged to come up with a voluntary way of reducing the number of plastic bags that were used and they did a terrible job of that and so there was legislation. And so the 5p charge on plastic bags uh, reduced that use by 80 to 90%. So a huge reduction in the number of plastic bags. And of course, if you go to a shop now, most people are bringing a bag that they've brought from home. So that's a big change in society. Plastic bags aren't a huge tonnage of waste, but they're something we use every day or see every day uh, as something we can avoid every day. And they're very visible if they're blowing around a landfill site or if you see them at the beach. So they're kind of symbolically really important, even though they're not really a huge tonnage of plastic. And then recycling, of course. So if you can't stop using it, you can't substitute it with something, you can't eliminate all of it by putting a charge on it, then you want to make sure you recycle as much of it as possible. And we have a deposit and return scheme that was just announced last week that that's really going ahead and the details of that. So that's going to collect bottles and cans for drinks and that will be plastic and cans and glass and so that's really good that will that will really increase the recycling rates I've got on this slide that it will double recycling rates but I think actually it'll do a lot more than that so we'll go from probably 35 40 percent up to more like 90 or even 95 percent for plastic bottles that's great but there's a jobs angle that's really important on that we can create this scheme and there will be a, an organization which is a not-for-profit not organization that runs the scheme, which will almost certainly be owned by the industry. And they will collect really good quality plastic bottles, clean plastic bottles that aren't contaminated with something else, which is what happens when you just put them in a general recycling bin or you try and sort them out of people's black bag waste. So this is really high quality, which means it's worth more. And what they will almost certainly do is sell that to the highest bidder. And that will probably be to a plastics factory that already exists in England somewhere. So we will go to the effort of collecting this material and then we will not create jobs and we will not create new facilities in Scotland because we'll just sell it to someone else uh, in England. And I've got nothing against England, but that's a missed opportunity for Scotland. If we've created that waste, let's try and create facilities and jobs in Scotland to actually deal with it. And of course, better than recycling is to reuse something. So I have a in the little office here, I have a bottle, a Coke bottle, one and a half litre Coke bottle I got in Norway 20 years ago. And it's made of a plastic called PET, which is a nice hard, nice hard plastic. And if you were to look at it, you would see that it's quite a bit thicker than a normal Coke bottle today. And that's because it probably does 25 or 30 journeys getting refilled. It goes back to the fillers, gets filled with Coke again, comes back out to the shops. Now, it's a question of whether we should buy in Coke at all, but the bottle is doing a good job because it's going round and round. Um, and that scheme, unfortunately, has gone in Norway, but Germany is probably the best example where there are lots of bottles that you will buy in a shop or in a pub and you'll be able to take it back. And there's a deposit on it, but it's a lower deposit than on something that's going to get recycled because that bottle is going to go back and get refilled with the same beer or whatever it is again. So lots of people are doing the right thing, uh, but we're not quite doing some of it in the UK. And so in Scotland, deposit and return scheme is really good, but it's not taking the next step, which is collecting materials, which will then be refilled and come back to us with more of the same product in them. And that would be an even better step. So we can build on it. Um, but it's not quite there yet. So let me give you a few examples of what's already been happening. Some of that's what's happened in Scotland. Uh, some of it's the rest of the world. Um, this, is, this is a good development. 
This is in my local Tesco and the broccoli is no longer wrapped in plastic. And the only reason they wrap broccoli in plastic is because the sticky labels with the barcode don't stick to broccoli very easily. If you wrap them in plastic, then they do. And so complete waste of plastic just to get a barcode on a piece of broccoli. Uh, so, but they've got the message, they've stopped doing it. But look, one shelf lower, here's the organic broccoli, which still has plastic on it. Because, well, I don't know, but they're clearly they're not really thinking this through. They've done some symbolic things, tokenistic things, but they haven't really thought through how we're going to do this. And this is a slide which just demonstrates some of the difficulty in getting rid of plastic. This is a proper fruit shop of which there are not all that many left. And there are many things on display outside this fruit shop where there is no plastic, but there are still quite a few things here where there is plastic. So this is you know, six or seven times better than a supermarket, but still your peanuts are in a plastic bag. Your uh, grapefruit at the top, if that's grapefruit, have got a plastic uh, net around them. Your half of a, a melon has got a uh, plastic cling film over the top of it. So this is an improvement, but it's still not perfect. And this is even in a shop that's trying quite hard but there are, of course, shops which are going completely plastic free. And that's quite a challenge for them, but it's great that they're doing that. And I'll come on to those in a sec. Um, so I just wanted to talk about the kind of things you might do. And um, from your descriptions, you're all at different stages of where you're at, thinking about plastic and what you might want to do. And as I said at the start, you can, you can start talking about just getting the issue on people's minds and helping them start to take the first steps to do something about reducing the amount of plastic that they use. And we have a Plastic Free Friday pledge that people can join in with. And we also have some guidance, which I'll show you in a second, which goes with that, which helps people just think about the amount of plastic they, they might want to use and might want to escape from. You can support some of these plastic free shops which are appearing. So it's great if supermarkets are changing their practice, but actually it's even better if your local shop is changing its practice. And some of these very specialist shops which are actually trying to get rid of plastic completely are showing a really good example. They're putting pressure on the supermarkets, putting pressure on other shops, and they're attracting business from people who actually care. So as a local campaigner, you can support those shops and try and help get people going to them and use them as places to get deeper messages out because there's a, an interested crowd who's going to those shops. Then the supermarkets, and I'll say something about a big exercise that happened in Ireland with supermarkets to make them feel even more of the pressure. Then another part of what's happening is, of course, I mentioned that plastic sometimes incinerated, which puts the fossil carbon straight back into the atmosphere and contributes to climate change. It also means that plastic's not available to go back into recycling. And there are a number of incineration plants being built at the moment and some others in planning, which you might want to oppose if they're in your local area. And then on the bigger issue of materials, there's the concept of the circular economy. And I'll explain what that is. And there's a bill which will probably be consulted on over the summer and probably uh, get into Parliament in the autumn. And that's really important. That's the potentially the biggest way to crack down on plastic and get other materials moving around the economy in a more sensible fashion. So that's really important, but it's a difficult policy thing and a parliamentary thing. So some, some bits of it are quite difficult to influence and some of it's quite complex. So I'll talk through all of those. And then as I say, when we get into questions, you can see where you want to concentrate. So very quickly on um, the Plastic Free Friday pledge, this is something we ask people to sign up to on our website and there's over 700 people who've done that. And it talks about, um, pledging that on a Friday in particular, you will try to avoid single-use plastic. And more generally, through the rest of the week, you will also think about plastic and do a bit of lobbying to try and change things, whether that's asking companies and shops to use less plastic or asking politicians to do something about plastic and resources. And that's on our website. People can sign up and they will occasionally get a nice email about something they can do, as well as being part of the community of pledges. And there's also a page which has got very nice top 10 tips uh, for trying to avoid plastic. And some of it's very obvious, like having your own refillable 
uh, water bottle, but some of the ones further down the list are a bit more thought provoking. So it's a really good list. I urge you to look at that. So that's if you want to engage people on why plastic is a problem and get them starting on the journey of taking action. So it's a very simple thing, um, but they will get emails occasionally, which encourage them to do a bit more and it helps them take personal action as well as to help them see if they would like to talk to their supermarket, talk to the retailers, talk to the people who make things or talk to the government. So that's that one. Then I mentioned the plastic free shops. There are at least two in Edinburgh. This is one I visited way to go. And it's really impressive. They, they do a lot of good work um, and they seem to be doing really well. They've had to extend their hours because it's so popular. So that's great. As I say, it's a good thing to encourage people to go to, but it's also a good place to get to um, people who are perhaps like minded. And so this one has taken some of our leaflets and so if you go there, you will see that Friends of the Earth is a bit visible. And if we have a big exercise on, on plastic, uh, we will probably promote it through that shop and the other one in Edinburgh. And I know there's at least one that's like this in Glasgow, where they're aiming to be completely plastic free. And there are others around Scotland. So if you've got one near you, again, good community to get involved with, a good place to meet people uh, and a good thing to encourage people to go to, just helping them with some publicity and making them better known. Uh, this is a campaign that ran in Ireland and it was run by our Friends of the Earth group in Ireland and one partner. Uh, it was called the Sick of Plastic campaign but the exercise was called Shop and Drop and across the whole of Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, there was a day designated last year where volunteers went and stood at the tills and they helped people take the packaging off and put it in a box so that it went back to the store so the store had to deal with it and it was very noticeable there were uh, lots of new volunteers got involved lots of supermarkets around Ireland got involved uh, and actually most of them were quite happy to have a box and to have these volunteers there so it was good engagement good publicity on the issue and some of those supermarkets have kept that box so people are still going to the till and taking their plastic off and putting it in the box and then the supermarket deals with it so it's again slightly trivial um, but it engages people and once you've engaged someone and they want to talk to you about plastic you can have a deeper conversation about what else to do and Greenpeace have been doing some of this so some Greenpeace local groups in Scotland have been going to supermarkets and doing exactly this helping people take the packaging off and hand it back and um, Sainsbury's has just announced that they're going to let people do this in a trial so it's kind of catching on we had thought we might run it as a big publicity exercise in the autumn this year so we still may do this um, but we need to see what else is happening because particularly because Sainsbury's have leapt ahead of us possibly so uh, we may do something else but this is nice a nice way to engage new people There's lots of people out there who care about plastic but perhaps haven't come across a campaign group, haven't got engaged with Friends of the Earth, and this is a good way to meet them, engage them, get them enthusiastic about working with you in your campaigns. Then a really hard edge one, this is incinerators, so these are operating, being built, or um, having a planning application, incinerators in Scotland, and there's about 14 of them. There are two or possibly three now fully operational. There's another one which is very close to fully operational, there are about four which have planning permission and in various phrases of being built and there's probably three or four which are just applications and so there's still some prospect of stopping them. Uh, so you may want to get engaged with this if one of these is near you uh, and it's at a stage where you can actually potentially stop it because it's still in planning or it's about to come into a planning application then that's that's a difficult campaign but it's really important because it's about what you do with resources and because there's lots of them building all of these, even if you thought a bit of incineration might be okay, building all of these means we will send lots of plastic, lots of cardboard, because they're the things that burn well, to these incinerators for many decades to come. If you build one of these, the economics mean you have to feed it stuff that burns well, and you have to keep doing that for about 40 years to make the, the business case pay back the money you invested. So that's the kind of decision that local authorities are making. Instead of getting good at recycling, instead of anticipating the ban that's coming on black bag waste going to landfills and getting really good at recycling and composting, they're thinking, oh, the easy option is just to build an incinerator. It's not really the easy option because they can take 10 years through planning if they're opposed. 
but they're doing that. And so in Glasgow, for instance, they build an, built an incinerator, and that means that they will never get above 40% recycling of household waste because they will always be feeding so much of it to the incinerator. So despite Scotland having quite ambitious targets to get to 75% recycling of household waste, in Glasgow, our biggest city, that can never happen because they've got to feed this monster incinerator. So that's really frustrating. So if there's one near you that's in planning, um, you might want to get engaged in trying to make sure it never happens or perhaps it gets built half the size or something like that. So that's a difficult campaign, but a really important one. And then finally, I'm just going to talk about circular economy. And this is the linear economy. So this is kind of where we are at the moment, or at least it's for most things, it's where we were in the 1970s. You would dig up natural resources. You would take them to a factory, you would make them into something, and when someone had finished with that, you would dispose of it in some way, probably stick it in a landfill. And if you think of the beginning of that, you're finding natural resources. If you want a ton of iron, you have to dig up 10 tons of iron ore, use lots of energy to turn that into a ton of iron, and then of course you've got nine tons of waste that's got to go somewhere, as well as your ton of iron. And at the end of the day, if you just chuck that in the landfill, it means you've got to dig up another 10 tons to make another 10 ton of oil, of uh, of steel or iron and so there are a few things that weren't like this so if you've got your milk in a glass bottle that got taken away and refilled and brought back then that was going around in a nice loop but those were kind of the exceptions and so the idea of the circular economy is this that you still have have to get some new resources so there's a small bit of new resources but most of it goes around in loops so you manufacture things from this material, it's used, but then it's recycled back. So material, you try and get material going round and round in material loops for as long as possible. And then at the end of that process, there will be some waste. So some things like paper, you can only recycle paper a certain number of times because the fibers get shorter and shorter every time you recycle it. And so office paper can be office paper again, probably several times, but then it starts to get poor quality and you can perhaps make it into toilet paper and then it's not really going to make paper at all. And so you need to think of something else and you may dispose of it or you may think of something clever to do, turning into animal bedding or something like that. So uh, that's the idea of a circular economy. It's a nice simple concept, but it's a really difficult thing to put into law. And that's what Scotland is planning to do. The government has promised to have a circular economy bill. They promised that quite some time ago, and it's not happened yet, but it is now actively being worked on. So there are new civil servants in new jobs working on what's going to be in this bill and when it's going to come forward. And as I said earlier, it will probably appear as a consultation in the summer or in the autumn at the latest. And that will be the opportunity for all of us to say, well, we like these proposals, but what about this? What are you doing about tyres? So we mentioned earlier tyres are a big issue. What are you doing about them? Uh, and so it's the the big structural opportunity to make a difference because we can change through a circular economy bill, which becomes an act, we can change how materials flow through the economy and what the rules are about when a thing actually has to become a waste or when you still have to think about recycling it or repairing it if it's a machine or reusing it if it's a bottle and all of those things. So a very big opportunity to make life completely different. Um, but also because it's a bill, it's a consultation, it's going to parliament, also quite a complex process to get engaged with. We're very active at the moment on the climate change bill. So it's very like that. It's very like the lobbying on that. And uh, quite a lot of that's involved local lobbying. So speaking to your MSP, speaking to your local council, speaking to your party structures, so your local SNP, your local Greens, whoever, to try and get the right things happening in Parliament at the end with this bill when it becomes an act. So uh, there are local dimensions, even though it's a thing which happens in Parliament, there are definitely local dimensions to get the right result on circular economy. And one of the things we try to do, and we'll try to do much more when we have a campaigner working uh, many more hours on this, is to uh, engage with the people who are quite lightly engaged. So they might have si signed the Plastic Free Friday pledge, or they might get engage engaged with something to do with supermarkets, and to talk to them about the bigger issues, the wider issues of materials in the economy and their relation to climate change, the relation to the oil industry, the relation to fracking, 
and try to engage them in helping us get a good circular economy bill. So that's a range of different things. I hope within that you've seen some things that get you excited and you think, oh yeah, that's, that's the one I want to start with and that'll be my next one. Um, but I'll stop there and we can see who wants to talk about what. Thanks very much.